Welcome to Distribution Talk with Jason Bader, the show where we dive into the stories, struggles, and solutions from business owners and thought leaders in the wholesale distribution market. Hey friends, Jason here. In this episode, I have the opportunity to speak with Rick Lamb, marketing manager with Frank Supply based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Rick and I go way back, and it's been a pleasure to work with him as both a distributor and an educator. One of the more interesting aspects of his business is their involvement in government contracting. As you will hear, there are plenty of hoops and barriers to selling the federal government, but when you get the process ironed out, it can be a very solid addition to any supply business. I hope you enjoy our conversation. This episode of Distribution Talk is sponsored by InSQL Distribution Software. InSQL is a fully functional distribution-based software package. I say distribution-based because that's important. Many alternatives out there say they do distribution, but they really aren't very good at it. They're generally watered-down manufacturing packages with a few distribution features tacked on. I only recommend software packages that were purpose-built to serve distribution. And these folks do it very well at a price point many smaller distributors can afford. If you're ready to step up to a fully loaded, scalable distribution package at an affordable price, look no further than InSQL Distribution Software at www.insql.com. That's I-N-X-S-Q-L dot com. All right. Hey, Rick, really, uh, thanks for the time here. I I appreciate you uh, coming on to Distribution Talk. Uh, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate this. Well, Rick, you and I go back a long way. You and I have known each other a, a long time in the industry, being in the uh, same business. But if you wouldn't mind, could you give us a, a little of your background, uh, how you got into distribution, uh, why you stay in distribution, just the, the whole shoot and match? Well, actually, I started actually on the manufacturer side. After I got out of Miami University, I interviewed with Ingersoll Rand and was hired for them to run a territory in Dallas, Texas. And I was the Ingersoll Rand Air Tool representative and Proto Hand Tool representative. At that time, Proto was owned by Ingersoll Rand. Then in 1984, Proto Hand Tools division was sold to Stanley. And I worked yeah. another seven years for Stanley. At that time, you know, my family was getting a little bit older and I wanted to stick around town a little bit more. I did a lot of traveling as a Stanley and Proto representative. So uh, there was an opportunity to become the sales manager at Frank Supply in 1991. And I, I took advantage of that. And that's where I'm at today for the yeah. last 31 years. Wow, that, that's quite a run, sir. Um, you know, it's funny. Yeah, speaking of Stanley, if I could just jump into there. One of the stories I love you telling is, is about that unique promotion, the, uh, the, the secret uh, shopper. Could you, could you tell the group a little bit about that? That's just, again, one of my favorite stories that you tell on a regular basis. So Well, as a Stanley rep, uh, they always put together these national promotions where people could win gifts and prizes and so forth. So what I decided to do at that time, those Walkman TVs were out. <laughs> yeah, I remember those. Sure. Sure. Double A batteries, a little black and white TV that when you still had UHF. Yeah. Did everybody want it one? So what I did is uh, I told them that if you get a phone call and you mention particular items that Stanley had on sale, you could win the Walkman. Well, I made the call. I said there would be a secret caller calling. And so I'd made the calls myself and I'd, sure. I'd call into one of my distributors and, and I right away go, Hey, uh, I'm looking for some tools. Uh, what do you've got going? Any specials? And if they mention Stanley tools, I go, my God, it's me. You want a, a Walkman TV? <laughs> yeah. And they were all thrilled. Well, all you had to do, it was once. And I'm going to tell you every inside salesman that picked up the phone was mentioning the promotions on Stanley after that, because everybody wanted to win it. And, you know, you just kind of salted it a little bit as you went along and so forth. And eventually I got something for everybody. You know, I, I just, as I said, I love that story. And I shared it with a, a sales manager, um, actually for my brother's company. And he uh, went and he would call in to the counter of a couple of the stores. And he was doing the same type of thing, seeing if they would recommend certain brands or ask. Actually, he was really looking for them to ask questions. But that was kind of the catalyst for that whole uh, testing your uh, your counter staff for asking questions and steering customers rather than just taking orders. Right. It was real successful. There was a lot more to the whole promotion and it was a big national three-month promotion. 
but that was the part that all the uh, inside salesmen jumped on and, and really appreciated it. And it, it just was a lot of fun when we ended the promotion. We had a good laugh about it all. Oh, I'm sure. No, I'm sure. And uh, those old spiff programs, you know, those types of incentive programs, boy, those were a lot of fun. Those were really a lot of fun at one time. Yeah, it seems like the manufacturers have gotten away from that big national type promotion and everything's more done on a, a regional level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if I could real quickly, when you left Stanley Pro and you went over to Frank Supply, what was that transition like? And, and maybe also, what are some of the things that you brought with you that really have helped you in your uh, distribution career rather than you know, on the manufacturing side? Well, I think the transition... I thought it was going to be real simple and easy because, you know, I've been calling on distributors and so forth for a long time, but there was a big difference leaving the corporate world and going to the family run business. You know, I was used to everything being done a certain way and all that. And at the family organizations, it, it was a little looser. Yeah, you know, yeah things for were, sure. You know, oh yeah. You know, I was used to yearly uh, appraisals and on your job performance, formal setting of goals and all that kind of stuff. But at Frank Supply, which was at that time a, a much smaller company, basically almost like a Ma and Paul run business at that time, things were pretty loose and uh, we policy changed as we needed to change it daily yeah, and, and that type of thing. And I think that was probably the hardest thing to get used to is probably a little less structure than I was used to. And obviously also, the multitude of products that you had to learn was sometimes daunting. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's something that a lot of manufacturer reps don't uh, appreciate is the breadth of product that you have to, like this, you know, you, you become really strong in your own brand and your own line card. But then if you go over to the distributor side, it all of a sudden spreads out and you've got now multiple, you know, 300 plus vendor, you know, suppliers with all of their lines that you're going to have to, or all their SKUs that you're going to have to at least be dangerously smart about. Right. And also, I think, too, a little bit of going to Frank Supply, this was more of a construction-oriented company than I was used to. And right. most of the companies that I was selling proto hand tools were more in the industrial distribution side, more calling on industrial plants and so forth. So I had to get myself in tune to what construction companies were looking for and how they purchase. It was just their purchasing tended to be more, uh, how should I say, I need it right now. Yes. Yeah. The industrial plants had inventory systems when they were running low on product. You know, they had systems in place to reorder that product before they ran out. But in the construction world, it tended to be, I need that rotary hammer right now because we got to get some holes in this concrete, <laughs> right. which was a little, you know, a little bit different too. A little less planning. Right. Yeah. No, no. I, I think that, yeah, the uh, industrial purchaser tends to be a little more sophisticated. As you said, they plan a little bit. They, they think a little bit ahead, giving that industrial distributor a little time to gather and, and, and get everything ready where in the construction side, it's more of a fire drill for sure. Yeah, it definitely. You know, you had the tool cribs in the industrial world where somebody was yeah. managing all the inventory needed at that plant. But, you know, as you know, on a construction site, things can change daily. And so you had to be able to react quickly. Sure, sure. Like I said, I, you know, I came to Frank Supply in, in 1991 and I've been here 31 years and I can honestly say it's been a great company to work for. The owner of our company, Melissa, is very generous and kind to all of her employees. And that's why we have 20 employees with more than 25 years at Frank Supply. And I just want, you know, make sure that she understands how much we appreciate the opportunity she has given us. Yeah, absolutely, Rick. I mean, I think, you know, she has been a terrific owner and, and really allowing you to thrive, you know, allowing you to, to do what you all needed to do to actually further your career without being too constricting in that. Right. When we've gone to her and said, we want to try these contracts, we want to do this and do that. She just says, I hope you guys know what you're doing and go ahead and go for it. And <laughs> let's see what, what happens. And rather than, ah, oh, that's out of our realm. She's been very supportive in all, all ways. Terrific. Well, one of the uh, areas that Franks is known for, and I've seen you talk about, and we've discussed in the past, is working with the federal government, you know, or working with uh, government contracts. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, how you got into that and how you learned that process? Because it is a daunting process. That is a complicated uh, web uh, that, that many people are very afraid of getting involved with. Well, you know, how we actually got started was, it was back actually in 1996, we had our first opportunity to bid a uh, contract for Los Alamos Lab. 
basically an integrated supply, just in time contract where you committing to delivering 95% of their orders within 24 hours and so forth. And it just so happened that we had hired a couple of people that had been in a company that had done that kind of government contracting before. And okay, it was really out of the realm of Frank supply, to be honest with you. We had never even attempted something like that. And these two individuals that knew a little bit about it said, ah, you got to try it. We, we've got to get put in a bid. And there was just a lot of lines that we had to get in contact with that we just weren't used to selling things like steric precision tools. We, you know, we yeah. weren't into that high end cutting tools like uh, Niagara end mills and GTD end mills and so forth. So there was yeah. a lot of products that we weren't real familiar with that weren't used in the construction industry that a laboratory, a sophisticated laboratory like Los Alamos was doing. So we sat down and put together, it took us six months to put this formal bid together and we sent it in. The laboratories called us up about three months later and said, we need to have an interview with you. And they went over our proposal and they said they made some suggestions about our proposal and so forth. So we knew we were in the running. Gotcha. And they said, we, you got to put in a best and final. You know, I'm sure the others did. So we put in our best and final. And, you know, we, we were a little smarter now after speaking with the labs. We kind of knew what they were looking for now. And uh, we put this together and then I remember it was uh, Christmas Eve, 1996. We get a call from the head of purchasing at Los Alamos Labs and they go, be ready to start the contract April 1st, 97. And can you do it? <laughs> you won. <And laughs> Lucky go, you, you won. <laughs> of course. And that we can do this. We'll be ready at that. Yeah, yeah, no we can do that. At all. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the scramble started. And, right, right. Uh, it was kind of funny. So like the first thing we had to do was find a location in Los Alamos. So this is kind of a funny story. There was an individual named Elmo C. DeBaca who owned all the real estate up there. Okay. And he takes me around to make a long story short. We find this one building that I think is adequate, you know, a little 3,000 square foot building with a nice little bit of a yard to it place. And it, it's in pretty bad shape. And and I say, well, well, how much? Elmo he was reasonable, like $2,000 a month for this thing. And I go, okay, we'll do it. And I said, well, Elmo, how long will it take to get ready? He looks at me with a smile on his face and he goes, I'm going to teach you a new word in Spanish. I go, what's that, Elmo? He goes, El Chipo. And I go, you're not <laughs> even painting the place, are you, Elmo? He goes, no, I'm not going to even paint the place. And so we took the building over and hired a general contractor and got it in shape. And by God, we were ready April 1st to start working on the contract. Because of that contract, though, after a few years, we understood a little lot about government contracting and, and what they call FAR regulations, federal acquisition regs. And we okay. learned a lot about all the do's and don'ts in the federal government through that contract. And then we decided to branch out and we had heard about GSA contracts. And so in 2001, we contacted a, a great lady that worked for GSA. Her name was Ellen Upchurch, just a senior contracting officer. And over the next like six months to nine months, she talked us through how to get a GSA contract, what to do and all that. Uh, with her help, we were able to get our first GSA contract. Oh, that's fantastic. So you're mentioning that, you know, it took six months for this first one, you know, at Los Alamos, six months to put the thing together, then another three months to find out whether, you know, you, you got it or not. Is that, was that really typical for, you know, nine month selling cycle on one of these things? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, like we're under our two current contracts. It, it takes a few months to put these things together. Gotcha. Uh, there, there's a lot of technical information they want. It's not just what price are you going to sell it to, but they want to know how your whole business system operates, how you're going to be able to support them in every way, uh, how you're going to implement the contract, who is responsible for what. They want resumes, who's going to run different things. You have security clearances in some cases. It takes about six months. And in addition, we had to put together also a quality assurance program. Similar to an ISO 9000. Sure. We were actually what they call NQA1, which is, it's an ISO 9000 basically for the nuclear industry. We oh, couldn't okay. sell to Los Alamos's weapons laboratories without that having a full assurance program in place. So that was an, another step that had to be taken care of. Sure. Sure. That was another hurdle for you uh, to get involved with this uh, GSA yeah, type of it, contracting. It, yeah. You know, I, I will say one thing about GSA. Once we got the contract, now we're, you know, we're into it about oh, six months to nine months. And yeah. I asked Ellen Upchurch and I said, 
you know, we're a rental company as well, full line rental company. Can we add that to our contract? And so after a lot of discussions and so forth, because GSA really didn't understand the rental business, they yeah. uh, made us the first contractor under GSA to have a rental contract. Oh, and, neat. Yeah. Nice. And, and then I was invited to Kansas City to speak to the GSA about rental. And yeah. this is kind of a funny story. So I'm going there yeah. thinking I'm educating the GSA. <laughs> this was back in 2002 or something like that yeah. on rental. But in the audience was also United Rentals. At that time, RSC Rentals, Curtis oh. Rentals. They invited all these national rental companies too. And here I am standing So here you are there. educating all these I'm guys, educating all your competitors. I, and I, I thought that was kind of funny that they yeah. invited all those people there. And obviously they had to because, you know, Frank Supply, we're a regional rental. They needed national sure. rentals players. And so, you know, it, it all made sense. But it was sure. very interesting. Sure. So, you know, one question, like really kind of looking back at that original contract that you did, and I know you had to sharpen your pencil pretty hard and you had to gather from a whole lot of places. Um, is it profitable? I mean, or is it really, you know, is it just a big exercise in moving paper and, and moving product? You know, that's a good question. You know, obviously you have to sharpen your pencil, but yeah. then there has to be a little give and take. And what we did not expect, there was a couple of things that happened that became very favorable that we did not anticipate how well it would really work out. The number one thing when we got the Los Alamos contract was we got cash flow. They pay you every 10 days. Oh, fantastic. All right. Nice. All of a sudden, you know, they're buying hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment every month and you're getting your money in 10 days and all of a sudden you are cash rich. That was probably the biggest advantage of the Los Alamos contract. Our cash flow improved unbelievable is the only way I could put it. Yeah, it, yeah. It a huge difference. It gave you the other two unexpected is all of a sudden we were able to put more inventory of different types of products in that we're doing that and then other commercial customers we had that product in stock and maybe right. we're not selling it to the labs, but all of a sudden our customer service level to various commercial customers went way up. And probably the final thing that really helped out, as you know, we're a member of the Evergreen Marketing Group and helped yes. build our volume with all the Evergreen suppliers. And as we all know, we get a little marketing allowance back from those yes, suppliers and that yeah. improved tremendously. So there were some effects that we did not anticipate. So. The answer to your question in a long way, yeah, it was well worth it and profitable. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, and, and I'm thinking about that, the the paid in 10 days. I mean, now you can start taking advantage of cash discounts in many cases. You can negotiate cash discounts with people that, you know, you didn't have them before, or they maybe give you a 1%. You know, you could say, well, you know, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm running a lot of stuff through you and I can pay you in 10 days. How about two or three? What do you think? So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're right. There's all kinds of back-end benefits that a lot of people don't understand going into these programs. Yeah, I think probably, as you well know from your experience in the industry, mm -hmm. when you pay your suppliers on time and when you need special favors and so forth on whatever situation arises, they tend to be more agreeable when they see they get paid on time. And so you're able to go to those manufacturers and say, you know, can you help us with the shipment here? Can you do this for us? And they're more than likely going to do it because they can look back and they, yeah, bring supply is pays us. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, you pay on time, you pay early, all of a sudden you're their new best friend. I mean, because yeah. they got plenty of guys that string them out, you know, plenty, <laughs> plenty out there that they make it tough on them. And, you know, one of the other things I was just thinking about, you know, Rick, is that Albuquerque in New Mexico in general is a small market. And you probably don't get a lot of attention, you know, from these, the reps and uh, national people, but then you start rolling dollars through them and paying on time. And all of a sudden you become, uh, you know, one of the favorite sons here. Yeah. You know, it, you make a good point because most of the sales reps that call on us, they're out of Denver, they're out of Phoenix. Uh, they have right. very few of right. them live in Albuquerque with a few exceptions. Yeah. They're all from somewhere else into the big cities and then they come to Albuquerque. So it, it did help us get a little bit of national recognition with some of the suppliers that because of the amount of volume that we were able to pull through these contracts. And once you get a reputation and knowing how to run these contracts, two other good things happened. Now, surprisingly, for the DOE, for Los Alamos and Sandia National Labs, we're the electrical contractor. 
we supply them with all their electrical supplies. Oh, interesting. Through a partnership with another, uh, with Summit Electric. Okay, sure. I know Summit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Summit Electric came to us and said the electrical contract's out, but it's a small business set aside. And us still being a small business, they asked us if we would bid it for them. And we did. You know, we worked out the split and what, what we each of us would do. And lo and behold, we got the electrical supplies. And now that one for us, it's mostly turning paper for someone's doing all the work, you know, <laughs> packing the stuff and shipping it. Well, hey, but you brought them to the dance. I yeah, mean, they couldn't got it yeah, with us. And then we also That's have right. for Los Alamos Labs, for the most part, we have all the plumbing supplies too. So yeah. we got the tools, the plumbing and the electrical. That's a, hey, that's a good deal. You know, Rick, that's really interesting that you all have really kind of leveraged this into not only the Frank supply and the rental stuff, the traditional things that run through Frank's, but now partnering with a couple other verticals, you know, to kind of come in and really offer a much broader offering that, you know, back to uh, any of these government contracts. Now you can really say, well, hey, we can throw your electrical together. We can get your plumbing together. All of a sudden you become a much, much more attractive uh, partner in these contracts. Yeah. We, people approach us like the big boys, like MSC sure, and stuff like that, that they ask us, would you handle this contract for us and stuff like that. And, and we take a look at it and, and see if it makes sense for us. And we've done it a few of them with them, you know, and we're way out of our realm. Uh, yeah. Shepherd, oh yeah. The Shepherd Air Force Base out in Wichita Falls, Texas. I mean, we were selling them their tools and equipment via a MSC contract. Now, gotcha. We were polite to MSC since they got us the business and we ordered everything from them for that yeah. co- particular contract rather than direct from the manufacturers, you know, because they got us to the, the ballpark. Gotcha. Gotcha there. And they had a distribution center right near Shepard Air Force yeah. Base. So those are the kind of things that kind of, you know, it just kind of uh, snowballs a little bit. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. So I would imagine that some of these contracts, I mean, again, when you're looking at this list, Few of the things you're like, well, I, I got to look this up. I have no idea what this thing is or or what these things are. What is some of the most oddball stuff you, you've had to say? Yep, I'll put a number on that. Dog tag machines. Dog tag machines. Okay. Yes, on the, the GSA contract, <laughs> the uh, Fort Bliss in yeah. El Paso, when the start of the first uh, Afghanistan, it was for Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, that's what it was for. I, I got to remember. They came to us and said, could you get us dog tag machines? And we went, really? Yeah. <laughs> you're a GSA supplier. We're looking for dog tag machines. By God, we found them. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then probably the other one was, you know, we got, we had to sell the Air Force Base up in uh, Colorado with their called fuel bowsers. And fuel bowsers are basically just a big pump. And it not only puts the fuel into the fighter jets, but it takes it out too. So if they have to drain them and so forth. So it, it's kind of a, just a pump. But yeah. you know, we got called and we called GSA and say, are we allowed to sell this? Because you have to stay within the scope of your contract. Right. And our contracting officer, Ellen Church, he old she just goes, well, what's a common name? I said, it's a pump. And she goes, yeah, then you can sell it. It's a pump. <laughs> hey, they call it a pump <laughs> and means you can sell it. Yeah. Yeah. You can sell it. So those are kind of, you know, and we've had some other interesting things where, yeah. you know, during some of the wars, they've come to us and, you know how fast can you get us connect boxes up to this air force base? And we're transporting 189s to a Matheson air force base and they're sending them to Iraq, you know, things like that. You know, how yeah. fast can you get those to us? Interesting. And you've been able to work with these partners like connect, for example, Yeah, they need something like that. You know, how fast can we get them there? And so forth. And it's just a drop ship at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that, how often are you able to drop ship some of these items? I mean, or are you having to run them through the warehouse? Um, it depends. Really, yeah. uh, almost all the manufacturers we've been able to talk to them about under the GSA contract if they would do drop ships for us. Gotcha. And some do and some don't, but majority I would say do that they yeah. make some exceptions because they know we're not really hurting existing distribution in a certain area with a drop ship because no one sees these, you know, unless you already have a contract with the government. Yeah. No one yeah. will see these. Yeah. It, it's almost like a separate channel. It really, it really is. Yeah. It, it really is. Yeah. You're not interfering with their normal commercial business. So they, they'll do it. And to a certain extent. 
So one of the things you had mentioned earlier was security clearances and, uh, you know, doing background checks and things like that. Have you ever run up against a challenge there with either one of your reps or a driver or any of that kind of challenge to that? Uh, not really. I mean, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit. We hope we hire reputable people. Yeah. So most of our people are, you know, there, there's not going to be an issue there. The only time it really happened that was, it was kind of interesting is we sold to Sandia National Labs, gosh, a truckload of Lista toolboxes. Okay. And it was a drop ship and the driver that had, was bringing the load got to the gates at Kirtland Air Force Base. Sandia National Labs is actually located on a Kirtland Air Force Base. Gotcha. And when he got to the gate, the guy was not a U.S. citizen, the driver. Okay. Gotcha. So here we got a truckload of boxes sitting there and nobody could unload it or do anything. It was just sitting there. And so finally, Sandia Labs sent down one of their own drivers that could drive a CDL and they drove the truck in and had the guy wait. Took it in. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, he had to take it in because Kirtland Air Force Base wouldn't let him in. Well, I, I'm sure they wouldn't. Yeah, just, no. That's just the way it was. He wasn't yeah. an American citizen. They weren't letting him on that base. Yeah, so yeah. Th- Those are the kind of, you know, we've had a few, uh, how should I say, we look back on them. There were little snafus here and there. Yeah. But all in yeah. all. Yeah, and it helps. It, it yeah. happens, but it's been, I mean, it's been quite an education. It sounds like it's been really a great ride. I mean, frankly, it. And really allowed you all, again, to expand your footprint. Because again, if you look at Albuquerque and New Mexico in general, if you just had to survive on the local population, I think that'd be a tough road. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the state is the seventh largest in, I think, in geography. And we barely have 2 million people, I think, living in the state. So it's all spread out. And, you know, Albuquerque has probably 40% of the entire population of the state. Right. Right. Once you leave Albuquerque, it, it gets pretty sparse. A lot you know, of jackrabbits right there in between. <laughs> jackalopes. Yeah. Jackalopes. There you go. Yeah, jackalopes. A lot of windshield time, a lot of jackalopes. Yeah. So. Yeah. But uh, it's been, we have a real nice government sales team. You know, we have one department. That's all they do is take government sales calls. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you know, really, it sounds to me like if somebody wanted to get involved with this, they really need to hook up with somebody who's done it before. I mean, I think that that's really... That, that's what I'm gathering. Yeah. It, you know, and they'll help you at GSA. I mean, if you start a plot, they have steps to take. See, we just went through it again, even though we had been a GSA contract for 20 years, the contracts are good for 20 years, but ours expired in last September. So we had to get a new one and we actually had to go through just as if we never had a contract. We had to go through all the original, you know, all the steps that are necessary. And I hadn't done it in a long time. So we, but we had to read the directions. Let's put it that way gotcha. and figure it out. Gotcha. It was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. We yeah, got to yeah. do that. That's right. Because yeah. you know, once you have it in place, it's more administrative. The biggest pitfall of the contracts is compliance. You got to be compliant. And you know, the compliance is up to you, not to the buyer. If a buyer is calling you up for something that is not sellable under the contract and you know it, you need to let them know. You can't sell it and say, well, the buyer wanted it. Compliance is up to you. I got you. Okay. As a government contractor, for example, under GSA, it's the Trade Agreement Act and certain countries, you just cannot sell product from certain countries under the GSA contract. And sometimes, you know, you're getting called by uh, buyers who say, hey, I'd like to get this. And then you tell them you can't buy that under the contract because it's made in China or it's made in Indonesia or something like that. So you, compliance is up to you. Gotcha. There's some other, without getting real detailed, there's a lot, few other things you always got to be aware of and, and check and make sure everything's, you know, you're doing it right. Interesting. You know, I've seen these GSA, uh, these requests for bids come through. I mean, again, this is when I was on the distribution side and saw these come through and it just looked like an absolute quagmire and a nightmare. So we, we wanted nothing to do with that, but it sounds like you've really done well and, and really uh, gotten your arms around this one. Yeah. It's just experience. Yeah. You know. You do it after a while. We made it, trust me, we've made plenty of mistakes. <laughs> Haven't we all, <laughs> you know, Rick? Haven't we all? Yeah, you know, we learned, well, well, we won't do that again. Yeah. You know, we got our hands slapped a couple of times. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's a nice compliment. Frank's why our main business is certainly commercial contractors too. We have a huge rental fleet to compete against all the nationals. And so- we do that real well, and it's just a nice little added gravy to the everything else we do. Gotcha. 
So, you know, Rick, uh, if I could segue for a little bit here, uh, if I could move to industry service, you know, this is something you and I have both been involved with our industries from a uh, board level and with Stafta and also with Evergreen. Could you tell me a little bit about why you decided to kind of raise your hand and say, yeah, I'll be part of this and I'm, I'm going to step up to the plate when asked? Yeah, I will start with Evergreen. You know, Evergreen's been very good to us. It's a great organization, well run by uh, Kevin Higginbotha. And I know Bill Ward will do a great job moving forward. I, I, he will. You know, back in 2007, I had to go in and interview on the board of directors. And sometimes two reasons there. One, you want to give back to the organization that's helping your business. And number two is, geez, I had some of my own ideas that I wanted to, you know, maybe tweak in there. Sure. And so this was my opportunity to, to have a voice. Yeah. And so forth. And so on the board for those three years, I was interviewed by your brother to get on the board. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't <laughs> yeah, know that. Yeah, oh, that's funny. Your brother interviewed me. <laughs> oh, that's correct. He was a key one that interviewed me. And I walked in and took a thing and I'm, I'm wearing a, a jacket, and a, you know, and a tie. And he's go, what are you doing? <laughs> wearing a jacket <laughs> and a tie. Yeah, that's certainly not my said, brother. Okay, that so is, this is not my brother's MO. Yeah. So I went, okay. So, uh, so that was good. That was a good learning experience too, because quite honestly, there were some really smart people on that board. Yeah. I learned a lot. The Steve Coleman's yeah. was on that board. Uh, Marshall yeah. Jones yeah. was on that board. And boy, you talk about two people that really knew their business. And, and I learned a lot from yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, segue over to Stafta. I mean, both that's something you and I share uh, pretty heavily there. Yeah, we both do, don't we? We were both yes, we do. presidents. We were Stafta. both former presidents. What were you president? I was president in 2002. Okay. Okay. I was 2013. I joined the staff to board in 2010. It was funny. I rolled right off the uh, Evergreen board, right on the staff to board. And so I served for actually four years. It, I don't think that was the way it was when you were on the board. What they did now is if the, you're the president, they ask you to stay an extra year. I was asked, but uh, that's when I was transitioning out of my business, oh, okay. you know, out of Acme. And so I just kind of said on the fifth year, I'm I'm a consultant and they didn't feel like a consultant would be a very good board member. So imagine that. Yeah, there so, you go. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, the staff, the board, again, you got other leaders of the industry on that board Yeah. and you're having all these uh, discussions at board meetings and so forth. And, you know, you just, again, you learn a lot and I found it to, you know, it was different than Evergreen. It had, as you know, staff that tends to be more of a service organization, providing help in things like inventory control. Mm -hmm. human resources and that type of stuff, accounting services, sure. and more towards that part of the business where Evergreen's more product oriented, at least right. in a generality. Yeah. You know, so there was a, some good things that came out of that. Uh, certainly enjoyed it. And, you know, Georgia Foley runs a tight ship. And uh, yes, she does. You know, I remember every month sending in my article to, <laughs> you know, that was going to be published in the uh, staff, the newsletter every month and getting my article back with all the red ink around this and that or saying, oh, maybe I ought to say it this way. Are you sure that's the right word you want to use? <laughs> and, and, and I'd get it back and, you know, I go, okay, George, I'll redo that <laughs> and so forth. You know, it's really nice. At least she, you know, gave you the opportunity to redo it. She just, uh, you know, she just took my work and said, eh, I don't really like what he said. I'm going to write it myself. No, she, she <laughs> yeah, used to, yeah, she sent me back my red like, thing and I, I'd look yeah. at it and, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll change it. You're right. That's the way I want to say it. There was a few times I said, no, that's the word I want to use. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you but, go. Uh, yeah. It was funny. It is a funny relationship with uh, yeah, the executive director there. You know, it's kind of a push pull sometimes. It, I remember a couple of times where uh, the article was not necessarily my words. And I remember having a guy come up to me at a conference. Hey, I really liked what you wrote. I said, you know, I didn't write it. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I'm sorry, but there that's you the way go. it is. You know, uh, no, I, I, yeah, it was pretty good. And, you know, of course, uh, the legendary speech that the president has to make at the, oh, yeah, at the oh, staff yeah. convention, you know, and, and sitting in there and, uh, being a couple thousand of your, uh, nearest and dearest friends. In front yeah. Of and everybody, you know, I did it the first time in front of uh, the board for practice and everybody looked at me and go, well, we got to change this. <laughs> 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 and so we, we worked on it. We got through it. You know, yeah. and, and they were right, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it was a good experience to staff that, yeah. and I gotta say that, uh, as you know, Kevin Higginbotham on Evergreen retired here, yeah. you know, the end of April and, you know, Georgia's going strong. Well, both of them came down to our open house here last week. We had oh, an really? open house at Frank Supply, uh, on April 28th 
And I invited both Georgia and Kevin and they both came down and we all had a nice dinner together. And it was kind of nice. You know, there were some other people that had joined us, a, a previous staff to president, Jim Smith, if you remember Jim Smith. Oh, sure. Jim, Jim was Smith. actually the year before me. Oh, no, no, not Jim. Oh, Jim Smith. Yeah, he went into commercial real estate. I, I still stay in touch right. with Jim. Well, he still so, lives here yeah. in Albuquerque. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we invited Jim Smith and his wife, and uh, we all had a real nice dinner together. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'll tell you, Rick, you know, the relationships that I've built, you know, uh, frankly, through the through the staff to board and through really any of the you know, industry uh, types of service that I've been involved with. I mean, it's just amazing how long those have gone and running into people, places, you and I see each other generally at least once a year, if not twice a year. And it's just a pleasure to run into to everyone and you can pick back up, you know, where you left off and it just, it always feels very natural coming together again. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll be seeing you in about another month or so in uh, Salt Lake City. Beautiful Salt Lake City. To help with the evergreen yeah. program that we put on and uh, yeah. looking forward to that. And yeah. again, it's yeah. the whole idea is, you know, these organizations that you belong to, you know, you get out of them what you put into it and, you know, just Agreed. trying to give a little bit back to the organization so that it can be successful. I think, you know, all the members of both those organizations need to do that. Keep that in mind. That organization only is going to be as good as the members want to make it. I always try to remind people that it isn't one way. You know, these associations and these organizations aren't one way, you know, that in order for them to thrive, as you just said, somebody has to step up and give back. And really, I know there are many people that would like to give back and they just don't know how. And I try to remind them, all you have to do is reach out to an association, an executive director and whatnot, say, I'd like to help. I guarantee they're going to find you a job. They're going to find you something to do. Yeah, that's for sure. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you can take it to another level too. You know, some of the, the manufacturers, sometimes you have to get back to them too and help them out a little bit. It's a great point. You know, you got to be partners to a certain extent and to be real successful with some of these major manufacturers that we represent, you've got to, you know, help them out at times too. And, you know, there's various ways you, you can do that and help them out you know, support their training programs, pay them on time, like I said. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's always good. Yeah, That's always good. Sure. You know, try new inventory and do this kind of stuff and work out programs together to grow your business together. And, and so you got to give back to them a little. It just can't be all one-sided. It's a very good point. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, participating in focus groups, things like that, and sharing with them, okay, here's what's going to work. And even if it's not in your geography, you know, say, hey, look, what, you might want to try this in your, and this is a lot of what you and I are going to be doing here in Salt Lake, you know, is that we give back and we, we share some of our experience with these manufacturer reps to help them be more successful and to understand the channel a little bit better. I know that a lot of people look at our industry and it, it doesn't seem real glamorous, but you know, I'm starting getting towards the end of my career here. You know, I've been at Frank Supply over 31 years. You know, I've been in the industry since 1977. And now I'm getting real close to retiring. And yeah. so uh, I'm looking down the road, but to follow that up, but what other industry can get you to the final four, three times, get you to a Super Bowl, get you to Alaska to go fishing. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened through the career that I would have never been able to do without being in this industry. And these manufacturers have made a lot of these things possible. And you know, I've got to see things and do things that I might not have been able to do. Truly bucket list things. Absolutely. So absolutely. You know, it was one trip that I always bring up that was probably the most rememberable was when we went to visit Sweden with Husqvarna. I, I did and the same was, trip. I, I know exactly. You were on that trip, weren't Well, you? I was on, the, I went in 2000. I'm not sure what year you went, but I oh, was there we, in we 2000. Were there, we were there on 9-11. Oh, when 9 11 oh, took oh. place. So gotcha. we were in actually in uh, a town called Judd Chirpin when 9-11 took place. And uh, it, it was a unique experience. Oh, for sure. For sure. You know, being out of the country with all this turmoil going on. You know, the group that went there, we kind of stuck together. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And there's a number of us that, you know, we still talk about it and all the things that happened and, you know, the pictures we took and everything going on. It was kind of a, probably one of the more unique business trips I ever went on. Absolutely. No, it was absolutely my favorite as well, Rick. I mean, I, I hands down that Sweden trip, one of my favorites. And yeah, I, I would always, I'll always be grateful to, you're right, to the industry for affording me these opportunities, you know, that I probably would not have done on my own. Yeah, there, there's no doubt about it. And uh, uh, so I've, I've always had a fondness for travel. So yeah, can't speak a lick of another language, but there you go. <laughs> 
And you can sure show up and, and try it out. Hey, I, so. I, I, your hand signals. There, there you, you go. go, man. There you go. Well, hey, Rick, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today and uh, share a little bit about your story. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, seeing you and uh, definitely look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Okay. Well, you take care and thank you for having me and uh, have yourself a great summer. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, consider sharing with your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast application. Links to sponsors, products, and services mentioned during this episode can be found in the show description area or at www.distributiontalk.com. Distribution Talk is edited and mixed by the brilliant team at the Creative Imposter Studios. This episode was brought to you by my company, The Distribution Team. We are a consulting services firm dedicated to helping wholesale distribution clients remove barriers to profitability, generate wealth, and achieve personal goals. To learn more about how we can help your company succeed, check us out at www.thedistributionteam.com.